Thursday, February 17th. It looks like it's 8.32 a.m. Um, this morning, we members, uh, we have a presentation by the uh, Minnesota Department of Military Affairs uh, with General Mankey and Mr. Don Kerr and Major Athman are going to be the presenters this morning. Um, it is nice to have them come in uh, once a year and give us a good update. And I think it's a, a good way to kick off the year and start uh, as introductions and, and maybe just a little bit of a reminder of how the uh, department functions and what they're doing. Uh, as as are also included with that, what I forgot to do last week was induce some of the staff. So before we get going, before we do the Pledge of Allegiance, I'd like to do that and start with Dave. Maybe Dave could, uh, you know, get his chance in the in the spotlight here and tell us a little bit about himself and and yes uh, i'm dave risen i'm the committee administrator and also the committee administrator for local government policy this is my sixth session as a uh committee administrator thanks nick uh my name is nick majeris i am the committee legislative assistant for senator lang and the uh, veterans committee this is Nick's second session he's been with me. John, over in the corner, you want to come up and say hi, John? <laughs> You're next on the list. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Jonathan Cotter. I am the GOP researcher for the committee. Uh, this is my fifth legislative session and my third in research. Thanks. And Chris Morgan, I don't, I don't think. No, if uh, I'm remote, there he is. Uh, hi, I'm Chris Morgan. I'm the DFL researcher uh, for this committee and uh, the local government policy committee. And uh, this is my fourth year with the Senate. Here's his face. And then uh, illustrious uh, Senate Council, Joan White. Joan, are you on? Would you like to say hi? I am Senator. My name is Joan White and I'm Senate Council on this committee and local government and higher education. And Andrew Erickson. I know I saw his name. Yeah. I'm here, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. This, I'm uh, Andrew Erickson with Senate Council Research and Fiscal Analysis. I'm the fiscal analyst for vets and also for state government. Well, thanks to all staff. Uh, I think a, a, a big thanks is due to you both at the beginning and at the end of the session, because I think we forget to do it too, uh, too few times in the mid middle of session. We're so busy, but uh, they are the ones that keep our, uh, our committees and our legislative schedules and our minds mostly straight. So uh, well appreciated. So uh, if you would, members, uh, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance as we start the committee hearing this morning. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, again, good morning. Uh, welcome to the presenters. Uh, I don't know who would like to go first. I, I did see General Mankey on the on the call. Sir, good morning. Uh, Mr. Don Kerr, good morning as well. And uh, Major Athman, how are you doing this morning? I, gentlemen, if uh, if any of you would like to begin. Hey, hey, good morning, uh, uh, Chair Lang. Good to be here this morning, and and thanks for hosting us this morning for a few minutes of your time. Uh, as you said, I've got uh, Mr. Kerr with me today and Major Athman. Um, so if you're ready, we can begin and I'll have uh, Mr. Kerr present the slides and then we'll kind of run through a brief uh, briefing as far as what we've been up to the last year, if you're good with that, Senator. A absolutely. Mr. Kerr, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, I'm, and he's going to push the slide. I'll, I'll do the talking, and uh, then we'll take some questions at the end. But uh, good, again, good morning, members of the Veterans Military Affairs uh, Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, I'm humbled and honored to serve as Minnesota National Guard's Adjutant General and have this opportunity to share with you some of the accomplishments of the Guard over the past year. You know, it continues to be busy for the Minnesota National Guard, which um, is a good thing, uh, but... Uh, you know, uh, we continue to be seen all around uh, the state and really uh, doing our federal mission as well. Uh, next slide, please, Don. When I became the Adjutant General, I uh, worked with the staff to develop a campaign plan to move the organizational forward uh, with the ultimate goal of better serving our community, state, and nation, and taking care of our soldiers. This past October, Operation North Star published and became our campaign plan. 
The three pillars focus on people, modernization, and partnerships, and are tied together with communication to ensure our priorities are communicated to our internal and external audiences. Additionally, this plan aligns with areas of the One Minnesota Plan to ensure we are assisting in the mission of improving lives of all Minnesotans. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the first pillar is people. Uh, they're paramount to our success and perhaps the most significant reason your Minnesota National Guard is recognized as a premier organization. Investment in our soldiers and airmen and civilian employees gives up the organization the means to tackle the state and nation's challenges we face and promote the actual value of choosing our citizens to be a soldier or an airman in the Minnesota National Guard. We focus this priority in two areas or what we call lines of effort, enabling people and enabling units. Enabling people focuses on the training and resources the organization provides or coordinates to ensure our soldiers, airmen, and civilians can complete their assigned missions. Allowing for continuous personal and professional development, we enable units by leveraging retention incentives to retain qualified people and properly equipping units to fulfill both their state and federal missions. We continue to focus on diversity and inclusion, and we've made significant strides in this area. Since 2011, in, in 2011, women comprised 16.2% of the Minnesota National Guard, and now women fill our ranks at more than 20%. Command Chief Master Sergeant Lisa Erickson assumed responsibility as the 14th State Command Chief of the Minnesota Air National Guard in October, becoming the first female to hold this role. In 2010, Black, Asian, American, Indian, and Hispanic service members comprised our formations at 7.4%. At 2021 year's end, we were at 18.6%. And our, again, our goal is to be a reflection of our community and the communities that we serve in. Next slide, please. Modernization remains a priority for the Minnesota National Guard and one of our pillars. Army Chief of Staff General James McConville said last year, we must transform quickly so we have continued overmatch against those who wish to harm and those who threaten our national security. Modernization ensures we have the right forces, infrastructure, and training spaces and systems to combat threats to our national security. In fiscal year 2021, the National Defense Authorization Act contained language uh, that was aimed at reducing Air Force C-130 aircraft total inventory. We engaged our congressional members to gain and maintain support to preserve the 133rd uh, tactical airlift wing and to push for modernization of these aircraft. The 133rd has been an instrumental part to the, both the domestic and federal mission in the state of Minnesota, as well as our nation. And we'll continue to advocate for our C-130s as a, a operational flying wing in, in, in Minnesota. As the Air Force continues to push to reduce costs and reduce the total aircraft inventory, we will continue to work with our congressional uh, allies uh, to preserve that force and educate Congress as far as the dual mission capability of the 133rd and the tactical air left wing that supports the state of Minnesota as well as our nation. Next slide, please. Our economic impact to the state of Minnesota is tremendous. The Minnesota National Guard has direct slide state expenditures of $62 million using funds appropriated by the Minnesota legislature. Through cooperative agreements with the National Guard Bureau, the Department of Military Affairs was able to leverage another $78 million in federally reimbursed state expenditures. The federal government also invested $449 million in direct federal spending within the state of Minnesota. A lot of that in, in construction dollars. Next slide, please. Partnerships. Our partners include those we serve, employers, state and federal agencies, and countries which share the the United States goal of global security. Partnerships allow us to improve our service in, to our communities, state and nation through the direct indirect, and indirect support. In 2021, we celebrated our 25th anniversary with our longtime partner of Croatia. This partnership has con continued to the security cooperation objectives of the United States by building partner capability, improving interoperability and enhancing US access influence while increasing the readiness of both partner forces and the Minnesota National Guard to meet these emerging challenges. Due to the pandemic, we canceled our annual exchange last year with Norway. We are monitoring the COVID environment and we are planning to execute it this year. In 2023, we'll celebrate partnerships of 50 years with Norway and, our, and the planning for the celebration is beginning shortly. 
Working with partners such as Homeland Security and Emergency Management, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Minnesota State Patrol, Minnesota Department of Health, Minnesota State Colleges and Universities, and the American Red Cross, we can combine efforts with these agencies to support civil authorities during civil unrest and, and as well as combating COVID-19 during this pandemic. All Minnesota National Guard partners are key to our ability to accomplish our mission and enhance us, enhance the ability for our soldiers and airmen to do what they need to do. Next slide, please. Just like in 2020, 2020 demanded more from our service members than the previous years. From March 2020 until September 2021, the Guard supported the state's health emergency plan with community-based testing, vaccinations, and support in long-term care facilities and transitional care units. We had a brief reprieve uh, where we had most of our, we had all of our service members off of uh, 502F orders uh, by Labor Day, but then uh, we had to bring soldiers back in. And since then we have supported community-based testing sites and have tested more than 165,000 citizens. With our partners, we train more than 400 service members as certified and temporary nursing assistants to support more than 30 long-term care facilities. Currently we have about 400 service members uh, Air Guard and Army, men and women supporting the COVID-19 missions. Next slide, please. Nearly 750 service members provided security at our nation's capital during the presidential inauguration last year. As I mentioned earlier, our 133rd airlift wing transported more than 90% of these service members to and from the national capital region. In preparation for the Chauvin and Potter trials, the Guard worked with multiple state agencies to support civil authorities to protect lives, preserve property, ensure, and ensure people's rights to protest peacefully were maintained. Next slide, please. Also in 2021, Army Aviation supported both aerial fire suppression and medical evacuation efforts in Spokane, in the Spokane, Washington area. During the, the same time frame. Both Air and Army Guard were mobilized to assist in aerial fire suppression missions in northern Minnesota. Next slide, please. Along with our state and uh, uh, domestic mission, we continue to execute our federal mission. Uh, today, we have nearly 300 soldiers and airmen deployed across the Middle East with smaller groups of airmen stationed in Africa and European countries. Additionally, we have our airmen supporting Operation Allies welcome at locations in the U.S. Most recently and ongoing is the return of Task Force 1194. Most of them have returned to Minnesota and now are on their transitional leave off of their Title 10 orders. Next slide. The 148th Fighter Wing conducted 2021 with two major training exercises, one overseas deployment, four state active duty missions, and 25 patriotic flyovers. The 148th Fighter Wing's top accomplishment in 2021 was its performance during an inspection where they received a superior performer in multiple team and individual categories. They will deploy later this year. The 133rd Airlift Wing, next slide please. On January 17, 2021, the 133rd Airlift Wing celebrated their 100th anniversary. A century ago, they became the first federally recognized Air National Guard unit in the nation. Their origins are tracked back to the founding unit, the 109th Observation Squadron, known as the 109th Airlift Squadron today. Additionally, they participated in three major training exercises in 2021. In April of 2021, more than 700 sol soldiers from 2nd Battalion, 135th Infantry Regiment returned to Minnesota after an 11th month deployment to Djibouti. While deployed, the battalion's mission was to provide force protection through security forces in the region of Djibouti, Somalia, and Kenya. Additionally, on the federal side, in June of 2021, nearly 150 soldiers from the 34th Military Police Company, headquartered in Stillwater, returned to Minnesota after a nine-month deployment to Cuba. The soldiers provided base security to, in support of Joint Task Force Guantanamo, whose mission is to conduct safe, humane, and legal detention operations. While deployed, the 34th Military Police was awarded the Major General Harvey H. Bandholtz Award for the second year in a row. This award recognizes the top military police unit in the U.S. Army, COMPO 1, COMPO 2, and COMPO 3. They were the best recognized among the entire Army. Next slide. Additionally, 60 soldiers from Bravo Company, 
based out of our St. Cloud Army Aviation Support Facility returned last month after deployment to Kuwait and Iraq. Well deployed, this aviation unit provided aerial movement of troops, supplies, and equipment with their CH-47 helicopters. Task Force 1194, the Bastards, mobilized in March 2021 to serve as the United States Central Command Regional Response Force based at Camp Buren, in Kuwait. While deployed, soldiers participated in the largest U.S. ground exercise with the Egyptian military. The first ever trilateral exercise between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Arabia, Kuwait Land Forces, and U.S. Forces. They conducted operations in Syria, guarding key regional U.S. infrastructure, and participated in the withdrawal of Afghanistan. As mentioned earlier, the task force is in the final stages. Most of them are returned and on transitional leave. Next slide. As you've heard, we've had a tremendous year. My professional team, dedicated airmen and soldiers, continue to serve in the community, state, and nation. Women and men who are always ready and always there. Uh, thank you for your continued support of the Minnesota National Guard. It might me and my team will stand by for any questions the committee may have of us. Uh, thank you, General Mankey. And if there's any members from questions, there we go. Members, any questions for the, the general? None, sir, you covered it pretty well. I'm gonna ask it, oh, Senator Weger. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, General Mankey, uh, for all of the accomplishments mission accomplished. And looking ahead, could you identify your top uh, three priorities? And also, if there's any opportunity in, you know, for additional funding if, with the surplus where we could help further address some needs. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, I would say, you know, I guess if you would ask me today, what's, uh, what's my number one thing that I am probably the most worried about? And that is, uh, you know, Minnesota has continually been able to keep our soldiers and airmen in, in uniform. Uh, you know, on the Army side, we are about 107% strength. Uh, and on the air side, we're about 101 to 102% strength. Um, we, but uh, our ability to have the, those extra soldiers in formation allows us to be more ready. Uh, so we have more personnel to do stuff. And, and we're seeing, based with the demand on the National Guard, we're, we're having, uh, you know, we're really putting an emphasis on retention. And we've seen some of our federal reenlistment bonuses um, decrease. Uh, so, I, you know, we have uh, recently rolled out a state uh, retention enlistment bonus. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we uh, additionally, we have right now we're limited to the soldiers have to have soldiers with more than 12 years of service. We can't offer them this incentive. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, thank, uh, thanks Senator Hall for introducing this legislation in this next cycle in the Senate. And I, there's a companion bill in the House. Uh, but along with that, uh, we'll probably be asking for some money, um, you know, for this budget for that. And we're seeing this trend across all 54 states and territories, not just Minnesota, but uh, with, the, with the decrease in federal incentives, uh, you know, we think that uh, we're gonna ask the state to uh, just, um, you know, most of our soldiers and airmen serve because they wanna continue to serve, but uh, this extra money uh, helps those that are maybe sitting on the fence serve. And we wanna keep our trained soldiers and airmen in boots so that they can continue to serve Minnesota as well as our nation. Thank you. Uh, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All the technology. Um, thank you. Uh, General Lemanke for, for your presentation. I'd like to know uh, regarding Afghanistan, how many of our forces were included in that uh, 1194 task force and what was your biggest challenge? General Mankey. Uh, thank you, thank you, Senator. Uh, we, we had about, uh, with, in, with the task force that went forward, we had nearly 1,100 soldiers from the Minnesota National Guard. Now that actually went forward to Afghanistan was uh, in the ballpark of around 400, uh, Senator. 
uh, you know, and, and um, but we had many soldiers that were remained in Kuwait that uh, once the Afghani evacuees arrived in Kuwait, they helped transition and process them through there. So it was, it was probably, you know, the majority of the battalion was involved with that. Not everyone was forward. Uh, the soldiers that went forward, you know, the skill sets that they brought from do, being citizen soldiers really helped uh, the ground com commander on the ground. He was a commander from the 82nd Airborne and had some brigades. But, you know, our, our soldiers, uh, because of some of their civilian skills, you know, we had welders and whatnot, really helped with the fortification of some of the gates and, and the uh, security around the airfield. I would say their biggest challenge when they went forward was probably just the fact that, you um, you know, they were told uh, they had to be on a plane within 24 hours. So just the friction that goes with that. But, uh, you know, they'd rehearsed and planned it. So overall, it went pretty good. But I think, um, you know, just not knowing what to expect when they got there um, and the ability to adapt quickly to the changing environment uh, was probably their biggest challenge. Uh, Senator Herr. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair uh, Lane. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, General Mankey, for your um, presentation. Uh, I, I want to make a little remark, but I also want to put in one or two questions along the way. Um, did you say that the uh, recruitment of, of in inclusion people of color is about 18%? Is that correct? Uh, yes, Senator, that, that is, we have, in, we have, st we have steadily increased that uh, percentage of inclusion in our organization mm -hmm. and it's something that we continue to work on on a daily basis because we certainly value that. Uh, as I said, you know, we want to be a reflection of the communities that we live in. Um, so we continue to, uh, you know, work uh, to improve our demographics and uh, in diverse individuals in our organization, you know, not only uh, for the ethnic, but also, um, you know, for females as well as, um, you know, uh, religious and, and different preferences that individuals have. We want to be an inclusive organization for all. Well, thank you. And, and I'm, I'm pleased to hear because I, I just did a little glance, uh, look at the percentage of minority in our state. I think it's about 17 or 18 percent. And, you know, maybe you know about this. It kind of hit on the ballpark there. And you continue to, you know, improve. Um, uh, I, um, I, and I, I, uh, I, I want, want to say is that what's the retention rate for that 18% that you uh, have been working with? Yeah, uh, uh, gr great question. Thank you for the question. And one of the things that we, uh, we are working on more is uh, more of that percentages in in our first time enlistments uh, but we continue to work for retention on those individuals as well and it, it varies bases on different um, ethnicities some are some are higher than others and, and some are lower and, and we're so what we're, we're focusing more at is you know we are an organization that starts you know you, you come in at a junior enlisted rank or a junior officer so we are tr we are working to um, you know, pr try to diversify some of our senior ranks a little bit more. And, our, and, and really, you know, we're focused now on the mid grades and we're starting to see uh, uh, positive, uh, um, positive improvement in that area. Um, you know, and, and of course with promotion, we have to make sure that they receive their professional military education before they get promoted. But uh, it's, I, I, Senator, I would say it's, it's a deliberate process, um, you know, and, and it's something that we're, we're paying attention to. And it's, it's but it's, um, it's it, you know, it's taken the time to, uh, I guess, let young soldiers see someone like themselves in a mid grade or a senior rank so they know that there's a path for them to get there and then uh, working with them to mentor them and guide them to do what they need to do to get to that position and and we're, we're continuing to make improvement there i i guess i don't have um retention numbers specific to uh, you know diverse individuals but that's something we can look at and get back to you yeah well i i really appreciate and uh really pleased to to hear you know um sometimes race ethnicity you know minority religion some sometimes it's very comfortable for people to bring up for discussion or even trying to improve um uh, in terms of our 
our statue of inclusion, um, you know, and, and there may be two school of thought, thoughts or more, you know, one school of thought would be don't, don't bring race into the conversation or don't bring, you know, in the city to a conversation that we all settle as, as one. There, there's another school of thought said, you know, diversity is our strength, you know, and I, I do clearly see here that you make it your mission to, um, from, you know, see that diversity is our strength. Although when, we, when we're in, in the field, you know, we all operate it as one. We are, you know, one brother and sister in, in, in arm. So I, I'm really uh, appreciate and pleased to hear that you working um, wholeheartedly to uh, improve your retention rate and get the bar to reflect the, you know, percentage of uh, minority or the, um, underrepresented in in our state. Um, my remark is, I'm 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 commending you, but uh, my remark is, I wish that our state agency or or you know our company or throughout use the similar model of recruitment. You know, uh, because we're making effort for people to go out there to protect our freedom, but at the same time. Many of our business operation, even our state agency, has not get close to eighteen percent or even ten percent. And so, you know, I my remark is I, I I wish and I hope that people have listened to you and making uh, making um, intentional stride toward an inclusion. So um, I I want to applaud you, um, but at the same time I, I wish our state would be mindful for, for the same model on, on a social level, on the representation level at, at any level of job. So thank you for your good uh, presentation this morning. Uh, members, any additional questions? Senator Weger. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And General Mankey, could you elaborate uh, about the relationship with the ROTC programs? Uh, the, at North High, which is in my district, it's outstanding, the participation. I assume you have, and, and there's programs throughout the state. Could you talk about that bridge uh, in those programs in high school and how it leads to the next step? Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, Senator. Um, I just, okay, I didn't want to make sure I was off mute. Uh, so we, you know, our, our primary touch point in high school is, is really with our recruiting force but you know not only do we go in there with the recruiters but we go in there with uh, you know we teach some leadership classes some development classes and just what I would call uh, physical readiness classes um, we don't we do not participate in any formalized junior ROTC programs uh, in the state of Minnesota with Minnesota National Guard soldiers. However, in universities and colleges, uh, we, we do participate where we have uh, soldiers at the, the three major institutions that have ROTC, Army ROTC programs in the state of Minnesota. Uh, it's the St. Cloud State, St. John, St. Ben's area has a program. Uh, uh, Mankato State has a program. And then the U of M has a major ROTC program. And we have um, uh, Army officers in each one of those programs helping with the education and training of these cadets before they become officers. Um, but most of our interaction in the high schools is, is through our recruiting force and also through, you know, we have some alumni that have graduated from some of those schools that, that give time back to those different high schools uh, to, to help some of the people in those districts. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, members, any additional questions? Sen Senator Anderson. Oh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> General, uh, at what position or what, what manpower are we in, in, with the Air National Guard and Army? I know when I was in the in the Air National Guard, we were at 100, I think 115%. We were over our, what we were, our mission was. Uh, and I'm wondering where we are today. <clears throat> yes, yeah, Senator. So. So on the air side specifically, uh, with the with the 133rd airlift wing in, in St. Paul, Minneapolis, we're 101.8 or 101.9. If you round it, it's 102%. On the on the in the 148th up in Duluth, uh, we're just over 102%. Now that 
for the wings is the sweet spot because once we get above that, we have struggles with funding the way that the air guard is funded. So if we run 110%, then there's some things we can't do for the existing airmen there because of funding issues. So that is really the sweet spot that we try to stay. I will tell you it's a, it's, it's, um, a little bit easier to maintain that spot because we don't have nearly as much attrition on the air guard side as we do on the Army guard side. And on the Army side, we are at 100 and 107 almost 108 percent strength um so uh you know and and that you know is something that uh as i said um you know that's that's something that uh i'm, I'm concerned about uh with with the covid pandemic we've had some struggles uh you know with access to high schools previously now I, i'm happy to say that this year that's a lot better uh so we're we're getting back after that that and you know our recruiters are out there doing well and market share wise the minnesota national guard is doing very well in the state of minnesota as far as um, you know the number of eligible recruits to come in we're getting uh, the majority of them in the minnesota guard either air or army thank you senator how did you okay uh sir uh i guess there, there's a couple of things i appreciate the uh the response and the, it's good to hear that the Army's at 107, the Air Force at 100, because we're fully uh, manpower. I did see a couple of, of uh, lower reenlistment numbers than what I was expecting uh, just over the last couple of weeks. And I guess as far as the, con the committee is concerned and, and hopefully where we have a little impact and have a little assistance to the department is, uh, and you, you mentioned this a little bit, but those enlistment incentive bonuses um, and, and, and <laughs> Along with those is retention. Uh, on, a, on a personal note, I've noticed we're, we're losing, uh, you, and you, you did mention that the mid-grade uh, officers and enlisted, um, I, and I think Senator Duckworth and myself have, have both uh, have experienced that where that it was never, ne never was something that you saw in the past. In the past, you either took a, a, a six year uh, stint and then they got out of the military or they were going to be in for their 20 plus years. And um, just recently was the first time I've ever really experienced multiple people in that 15, 16 years getting out of the military. What can we as a committee uh, do to help those, those incentivize those people that are above, not only in, in again, Senator Howe has the bill coming up, but uh, 12 plus years, I think is, is a step, but we're also competing with the civilian market like we've never competed with the civilian market before. Uh, aviation specifically, uh, we're dealing with, with this, the cyber, you know, I call them kids because they're all kids, but those cyber kids, those individuals that are, are moving on to the civilian market in such a, a huge numbers. Uh, and then we have uh, a lot on our plate as Minnesota Army National Guard is concerned and, I, and the Air Guard included. Civil unrest, state active duty missions. We're always doing floods and fires. Uh, that federal mission that you know, we listed a long group of individuals. Um, and then COVID response even. You know, we got a lot of people in the, in the long-term care facilities that is, uh, the guard is stretching its, its capability legs in, in, my, in my opinion. So what do, what do we do as a committee to help you? And that is a long, complicated answer, I know, sir, but. <laughs> Yeah, so so thanks for the questions, uh, Senator Lang, um, and and I'll, I'll give my two cents here, and then I'll, I'll let Mr. Kerr chime in. As, as I mean, I certainly value Mr. Kerr, and he's been here longer than uh, both of us, Senator <laughs> Lang. So, but uh, you know, we just, <laughs> we just started. Uh, February is the first month that we offered a state reenlistment retention bonus. Uh, we just literally rolled it off the press. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's a significant bonus. It's a, it's a pretty good, uh, if you reenlist for six years, uh, you're going to get, uh, you know, over the course of six years up to $15,000. So it's, you know, you put that with the federal bonus and, you know, some, some soldiers are going to, could get up towards $27,000 for six years, which I think will make some people think, um, you know, so, there will be some funding tails that come with that later. I mean, we have the money in our budget to do it this year, but uh, we want to preserve that. I, I think the other thing is, um, uh, you know, the, the other thing that I just say is we have been busy, but, you know, uh, 
initially we put soldiers on who haven't wanted to be on, um, you know, when we first launched people on a 502F, we, we kind of threw the net. But as we brought people in the net, uh, those that we needed to get back to their civilian jobs or back to their school, we've done it. Of the 400 and some soldiers that we have on now, they're all okay being on duty, you know, and I shared this with Senator Howell earlier this week. Um, so we're sensitive to that, you know, and I think it's, you know, for my team, I ask, uh, you know, and I know you're a commander, Senator, as well, but I ask you to work with your soldiers. And sometimes we just need to let our soldiers take a knee uh, to preserve them so we can use them another day. Um, you know, and I was talking to the soldiers and doing that. So from a, from a Senate standpoint, I think the, the number one thing is, is help us with the funding later uh, when that comes forward. And, um, but uh, Mr. Kerr, I'll turn it over to you if you got some thoughts. Mr. Kerr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, General. For the record, my name is Don Kerr. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Department of Military Affairs. And this kind of gets back to Senator Weger's question, and I know you've made allusion to a Senator, but from the agency's perspective, you can really help us out directly in a three-step process. First of all, when Senate File 2635, that's being carried by Senator Howell, comes forward, uh, we'd really appreciate your support in getting that bill passed. Um, the legislature in the past has established a really good program with really good autonomy for the adjutant general to provide enlistment incentives and re-enlistment incentives. Uh, we do have a constraint in there that made sense until recently, and uh, that this bill will fix that. It basically, right now, the tag is restricted. He cannot offer a re-enlistment bonus to anyone with more than 12 years of service. The, the presumption was that once you had 12 years of service, the, the golden handcuffs of a pension were upon you and you were incentivized to stay in because you had so much invested in getting a pension. Uh, and I'll go into more detail when the, when the bill is heard, but basically the Congress changed that. And uh, now uh, everyone that's come into the military is in a different retirement program that does not require them to do 20 years of service. And so we no longer have that incentive to stay beyond 12. And, opening up or eliminating that restriction will really allow the adjutant general using a program that's already in place to better incentivize people who are those careerists that we're seeing a, a real challenge uh, upcoming. We haven't seen it too badly yet, but we are starting to see it. So that's the first step is that minor policy change just allowing us to do that. Uh, the second one is included in the governor's supplemental budget, and it's uh, to support the state implementation of an army program called Holistic Health and Fitness. And that is a program that's designed to provide counseling and assistance to service members who are having difficulty meeting medical, physical, and weight control standards so that they can be retained in the National Guard. And the Army is rolling this program out, but they're rolling it out brigade by brigade. And as you might imagine, the active brigades are being fielded, and I think they're doing about three a year. So it'll take them about 15 years to get the active component fielded. And we want to try to replicate the program in the guard and we, we think it's a, a useful investment because uh, clearly we, we get a lot of money back when we can when we enlist a service member into the minnesota national guard the cost that's in, that's thrown into that by the federal government is anywhere between 60 and a hundred thousand dollars just for initial entry training and we think anything we can do to retain that initial sunk cost that investment that the nation has made into those service members to say nothing of the experience that they gain while they're in is really uh, it's worth trying. And, and so we think we're going to put some money into that to try to improve our retention rate. And then the third step of that is we've also requested from the governor uh, a, a, about a $2 million supplement from the enlistment incentives appropriation to help us pay for uh, more enlistment bonuses, more re-enlistment bonuses. Actually, re-enlistment bonuses are where we're focusing, again, because we want to look at that retention. So those are the three very specific things that we're going to ask the legislature for this year, Senator. And uh, like I say, we'll talk more about that when the bills actually come up, but that's the, 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 the syllabus of what BMA's um, requirements are. And of course, we still, Senator Lang, your bill that, that was introduced last year that's still moving, we think that's very important, the update to the Minnesota Code of Military Justice, because we think it's important that we take care of our soldiers that way too, uh, that they feel that they're being cared for by providing better uh, leadership to them and better protection uh, so that they don't have to worry about um, really being abused inside the military on its own. So those are the things, Senator, that I think are really significant from the agency's perspective in this legislative session. Well, thank you, Mr. Uh, sorry, go ahead. 
Uh, I, I was just going to ask Mr. Curry, do you want to just touch on our bonding request too, Don, since? I, Mr. Chair? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, so uh, we will also, we also do have a bonding request coming in. Um, and it's a two part bonding request that really the first program that we have is to fully fund the programs that were already approved in the previous bonding cycle. Um, we had a combination of being a little bit short funded by the conference committee. And, and since we uh, have started trying to do those projects, uh, construction costs have gone through the roof. And so we're short funded for three of the projects that uh, we're trying to get done, which is the, the Rosemont, Marshall, Fergus Falls and Moorhead renovations. And then the uh, second part of our bonding request is to then get funding for the full renovation of Rosemont. Our initial request was only for the design funding. And that's a pretty big bill, but we, we think it's super important that we stay ahead of the maintenance on these buildings so that we can continue to provide quality spaces for our service members to serve. Um, and that, that's kind of our bonding wrapped up in a nutshell. Over Roger that, uh, Mr. Kerr, I guess the, the bonding bill will be uh, arm twisting uh, from our perspective. So we'll, we'll get on that. So uh, Senator Newton with a question. Yes, uh, thank you. And, and uh, I think I should speak with Mr. Kerr about this. Um, uh, in terms of the facilities, where are we in terms of, uh, of the facilities that had been scheduled to be closed? <clears throat> That's the first question. Um, and also, uh, for either you or General Mankey, uh, I, I'm concerned with the large number of deployments that we've had overseas and the extended periods of uh, time that the, the uh, soldiers and, and uh, others have been deployed. Uh, are they having trouble uh, returning to jobs when they, when they get back home? Thank you. Mr. Kerr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Newton. So we have a very detailed plan. We have successfully closed and divested of a number of our armories over the last few years. Uh, we, we did a lot of analysis and research into exactly where we need to maintain our presence, and we are following our plan. However, as we expected, uh, the federal and state funding to implement the plan as we had desired has fallen behind on timing. And again, that, that wasn't it wasn't a surprise to us. The plan was fairly aggressive, but uh, we have been able to move forward. For, for example, right now, um, we're actually building a facility in Luverne that we're doing based on a very generous contribution from a local benefactor, along with uh, proceeds from the Minnesota State Armory Building Commission. So there actually hasn't been any legislative involvement in that armory, but we're going to be able to divest of a 100-year-old armory in Luverne. We're currently building a replacement armory in New Ulm, uh, that's 100% federally funded or nearly 100% federally funded. They actually had a couple of items that we have to pay for there. But that will then replace the old 100 plus year old armory in, in, in New Ulm for us. And uh, we have a couple of consolidations that are planned, but those uh, haven't yet hit the books. And when those consolidations occur, we will probably close two armories by replacing them with one new one. And I can give the, the committee a more detailed briefing on what that plan is, if uh, the chair would, would desire. Uh, it, but like I say, we've looked out 50 years and uh, it's kind of funny because we we actually have added uh, replacement planning for buildings that we're doing ribbon cuttings on. So it's kind of interesting to see the, the building we just built go on the replacement plan on the bottom. It's kind of, you have to bend your mind a little bit to wrap your arms around that one. And I, I think, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I should probably defer to General Mankey on the, uh, the uh, challenges that our service members who are returning can, can, uh, can face. Sure, General Mankey. Oh, you're muted. There you go. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Newton. Um, you're absolutely right. We have been busy with our federal mission. Um, and, you know, as we look forward to 2023, 2023 actually, with 1094 coming back will be probably the year that we've had the least amount of Army Guard soldiers deployed since 9-11. So uh, it is a year that we are really backed off of our federal mission support that's been asked of us. Um, you know, and, and we continue to train so that we're ready in case something happens again where we're needed. But uh, we're looking forward to 2023 really being a year where we have a lot less soldiers gone. And, you know, the thing that as far as taking care of the soldiers when they come back, um, 
you know, the holistic health and fitness that Mr. Kerr talked about, as well as, um, you know, taking care of soldiers when they get back, looking at their families and stuff is something that we take very seriously. Uh, does that answer your question, Senator? Uh, yes, uh, I, I'm also concerned about, you know, our soldiers when they return, especially after, after they've been, been deployed for a while, whether the jobs are still there, uh, you know, under the Soldiers and Sailors Relief Act, they're supposed to be there. But my experience always was that they, they tend not to be. Uh, and, and as long as I have you on here, General, I, I um, wonder if, if you perceive any change at all with the new uh, Biden administration in terms of um, <clears throat> the mix of active duty and guard reserve uh, in terms of, of uh, who's going to go first uh, when we have missions, whether it's going to revert back to the way it used to be, where the active uh, military was uh, primarily the ones deployed, uh, supported by the Guard, or whether it's going to stay the same way, if you have any ind indication at all about that. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Senator. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a little bit too early for us to tell. I mean, with the with the withdrawal from Afghanistan, the the demand for the R sent region, CENTCOM region, which has been the one that we have filled the most, ha has decreased significantly. Uh, and you know, 2023. That now these mobilizations in 2023 were planned to be less for the Minnesota National Guard. Beyond that, I think it's too early for us to tell um, what the new administration's uh, plan will be and what Secretary Austin's plan will be as far as the integration of uh, COMPO 2 and COMPO 3. I mean, the, the Guard has really transitioned from a strategic turn to an operational reserve. And, and some of that is good, uh, maybe not at the pace that it's been, but um, you know, we, we still have a lot of our soldiers and airmen that join the guard because they want to deploy they want to go do something um so i, I think i would i think it's fine if we pump the brakes a little bit for a, a year or two here and and slow down the train uh but i don't i mean i i, I think from a readiness standpoint we it may hurt us if we go back to the way it was as, as a strategic reserve and I don't see um, I, I don't see that I don't see anything that I've seen at my level yet indicating that we're going back to a strategic reserve if that answers your question yes thank you very much Senator Anderson uh, thank you mr. chair um, either to uh, general Mankey or to uh, mr. Kerr uh, you mentioned uh, the uh, $2 million for the state reenlistment program. And then you brought up this uh, new program called the Holistic Health Fitness Program. And I'm just wondering what you're projecting for a cost or what you're looking for as far as state funding for that. Maybe it's coming from the federal, I'm not sure. Uh, but what kind of funding are you needing that? And then uh, because suicide has been a major issue uh, from the governor's standpoint way back in 2018 2019 i'm just wondering if that is being included in this program what are the details to that program as it, it comes uh, and gets put forward mr kerr or general Mankey, either thank you mr chair and senator anderson for the question so and i don't have the document in front of me. i apologize for that i'm I'm, uh, I'm just getting back into the work mode here i i was off for a month getting a hip replacement and some of my my discipline hasn't re returned yet so I'm not as well prepared, but my recollection, Senator, is that the uh, initial request that we've got is for $635,000 for holistic health and for fitness, and I think it's about a half a million the year after that. So uh, the aggregate re request would be for, I guess, $2.6 million when you add in $2 million for enlistment incentives and the $635,000. Uh, and there is a, a, a suicide prevention component inside holistic health and fitness. Most of the holistic health and fitness component that we're adding has to do with physical therapy, um, some, some, uh, some training and, and coaching aspects, but because we do have uh, some other resources that we put into, uh, into suicide prevention. So we've kind of kept that separate, um, but there is a component within that from a counseling perspective, if that answers the question. Thank you, Mr. Kerr. Um, I'm just wondering, maybe General Mankey can answer this question as far as uh, individuals coming in. And it was mentioned, I think, by Senator Herr 
the concern for people enlisting in the military. Do you find that uh, one of the factors in, in bringing people in is weight? You, because of this new program, uh, are there a lot of people that would like to come in, but because of their weight factor, uh, it, it uh, eliminates their opportunity to serve? Either of the gentlemen. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair, thanks, Sen Senator. Uh, you know, the, the fact of the matter is our pool of applicants who are eligible to serve in the armed forces, whether COMPO 1 active or the Guard or the Reserve, is continuing to be reduced, um, either be and primarily because of a medical and or fitness standpoint, where they were prescribed maybe some some uh, medicine when they were younger that has, is disqualifying them or whatnot. Um, and and uh, people that are, you know, you can be a little bit over, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but you can be a little bit over the height weight standard when you come in. But uh, um, this program would not be for those. It would be for uh, service members who have already came into the guard that uh, are maybe struggling now to, to get them so they are within standard and then hopefully adjust their lifestyle so that they can remain in standard and we can keep them in the guard uh, rather than chaptering them out. But to answer your question, uh, we, we do see, you know, I mean, we're a, we're a product of society. I mean, Americans are, are generally bigger than they were when the standards were set in, in, the, Air, in the Air Force a long time ago. And, and the pool of applicants that we can put into the uh, armed forces is, is less than it was, um, you know, even 10, 15 years ago. Uh, thank you. Mr. Kerr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Anderson. I do have a correction to my numbers. The uh, H2F program is actually 765,000 in the first year and 742 after that. And our supplemental request for incentives is 2 million a year, uh, 2 million for uh, state fiscal year 23, and 2.5 million a year after that, in the details. Thank you. Members, any additional questions? I, uh, I think we've successfully, uh, well, we're, we're both of you gentlemen out a little bit on the, on the mental gymnastics as we've gone forward, but I appreciate your willingness to answer some, uh, some questions and some of our concerns. And hopefully uh, as the committee moves forward, uh, we can address some of the financial uh, things we've talked about and, and uh, definitely uh, kind of move into the fulfillment of the budget that we passed last year. So um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. I appreciate both of you joining us here today. Uh, members, uh, seeing, you know, this was the uh, one thing we had on our agenda and uh, it's a good way to get the year kicked off and I appreciate uh, the involvement of all the members. So uh, with that, uh, seeing nothing further on agenda, uh, the uh, committee is adjourned.